Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get things started. Thank you guys for joining us. We're going to be talking about how to really get organized with your photo library, techniques you can use to have a truly organized photo library. And I think you guys will enjoy this. This is a free workshop put on by Photo Focus. My name is Rich Harrington. I am the publisher of Photo Focus. And for those of you who are joining us live, thank you. We'll be taking your interactive questions throughout the event. And for those watching the replay, thanks as well. We hope you find this helpful. So what we're gonna be covering today is a wealth of techniques, but it really comes down to this. If you've ever felt tired of trying to find the perfect photo, you're not sure which one is the best, we're gonna share some tactics with you to quickly sort through and cull your pictures to find the best pictures, and also some strategies so you don't feel like you've lost photos. So I'll share with you some different search techniques as well as strategies for getting your hard drive set up. And I'll show you how to take a lifetime of photos and actually condense them down and fit them onto your smartphone. How you can take that whole library with you and have it able to be organized and searchable on the go. So I'll be sharing with you a lot of different strategies that I think you'll find helpful. So thanks for that. And uh, this is an interactive event. So we'll absolutely take questions during the event. My name is Rich Harrington and I welcome you to join us today. So thanks again for coming out. Some of the specific topics that you're gonna to learn about We'll discuss how to set up a hard drive for a multi-application workflow. So you don't just have to use tools from one manufacturer. So it all comes down to an organized hard drive. We'll also talk about strategies for cloning your hard drive each night so you're ready for emergency recovery. Go through some strategies on how to avoid data loss, including 321 backup. And talk about ways of using the cloud effectively to backup your data. And I'll show you ways to add metadata to your images so they're easily searchable. And we'll take a look at two pieces of technology that are super helpful. Aftershoot, which can analyze your photos, identifying the best images, the sharpest photos, the ones that have the best facial features, the ones that have proper exposure and are ready to post, as well as ones that will do great on social media through a unique algorithm. And I'll show you how to keep your entire photo library in sync across your laptop, desktop, smartphone and tablet, even multiple operating systems using Mylio. So thanks for joining us today. And I think you guys will enjoy this. My name is Rich Harrington and I'm a visual storyteller. I've been helping people learn a lot more about photography and video for about 25 years. I also have my own creative hands-on company where we produce content for a wide range of clients. I've done a lot of work lately with AI as well, helping people learn more about how AI can help them to really keep their images and their content looking great and well-organized. And when I'm not busy doing everything professionally, I of course enjoy being both a husband and a father. Uh, through the years, I've put together 40 books and more than 200 courses. And I am the publisher of photofocus.com, which many of you may have discovered this webinar from, as well as an educational website called ThinkTap Learn. I get to regularly speak at conferences and events. I'm looking forward, for example, to the upcoming NAB show in Las Vegas later at the end of this month. And when I get a chance, I serve as a consultant as well as a photographer and a director. When I figure something out, I like to put it out there and share it. So I put out a lot of courses through the years and a lot of different books, all designed just to help people learn more about creating different types of content. The approach I'm gonna share with you today is really one built on organization. So I'm a little bit unusual in the creative space. I actually, after working as a creative for many years, went and got a degree in project management. And so I take a very methodical approach to organizing projects. As I shared with you, we have a consulting and education company called ThinkTap, and my hands-on media production company is called Red Pixel. We're based in Washington, DC, and we mostly do work for nonprofit companies and a little bit of government sector and a lot of high tech companies. So we produce videos, photos, lots of different pieces. So gets you an idea of some of those projects and some of the technology I've had a chance to work on. Wow, some really interesting results coming in about how you guys feel about your photo library. So it's great to see. I'm glad that uh, you guys are able to uh, walk us through some of that. So excellent. Let me go ahead and uh, just take us forward here. It's looking good. Let me just free up a little bit more memory. <laughs> that brand new Mac Pro cannot come soon enough. I'm looking forward to that uh, new Mac Studio machine, although mine is back ordered. So 
I'm uh, pushing my Mac Mini's memory to the uh, limits here at my home office, but that's okay. There we go. We should have a little bit more memory freed right now. Hopefully Zoom's running a little bit better. All right. If you want to get in touch, I'm not hard. Just reach out to LinkedIn. So thanks for that. I see a couple of messages in the chat. Hi, Mike. Good to see you. And Bradley, welcome. Thanks for joining us. So here's something I'd like you to think about. This is the number of photos stored, and you can see the growth over the next five years. So these are some uh, factoids I got from my friends over at Milio, and I think it's interesting. You see that things are growing at about 13 to 11%, which is pretty crazy. So that means that you know last year, people had about... 7 billion photos stored on their, sorry, 7 trillion photos stored on devices. And that's going to be at 1.3 trillion, not very long from now. That's insane if you look at that amount of growth. And so your images are going to keep growing as well. And it's just something to keep in mind when you think about that magnitude. Basically, over a five-year period, people's photos are almost doubling the amount of content they create. So that's really interesting. We're seeing more growth, more capture, more devices capable of capturing images. All right. Thank you guys for those of you who voted. Looks like everyone has cast their votes pretty much. A couple interesting things here that I think are good to note. Uh, I'm seeing that uh, about most of you, 70% are saying that your library is somewhat organized. So we got room to grow, which is great. Your photo libraries are all over in size. We've got even distribution here for less than one terabyte, one to three terabytes, three to eight terabytes. Uh, my photo library, when I add in photos and um, time-lapse photos, is about 11 terabytes. If I add it in my video files, well, it's a lot more than that. But uh, my photo library is sitting around 11 terabytes myself. And uh, most of you have that on a single drive, which is good. That makes it easier to organize and back up. But a lot of you have it spread out over many drives. So that gets a little bit tricky. And it looks like you guys are using a lot of tools like Lightroom and Bridge and Lightroom Classic to organize. A couple people using Milio and On One, so that's great. And it uh, looks like most of you are new to Aftershoot in Milio. So you're gonna learn some things tonight. So perfect. Thanks for casting those votes. That helps me understand where you guys are all at. And uh, we'll just help us customize tonight's webinar a little bit for you. So thanks again. All right, so let's get started here and lay the groundwork about organization. So last time I gave this webinar, uh, some folks joked and they said, I finally met a nerd who was more organized than me. And I think they said more paranoid instead of organized. But I am kind of paranoid when it comes to my images because they're really important to me. So you're gonna have to decide how organized you want to be and how backed up you want to be. Ultimately, it's personal choice. Anything is probably better than you're doing now. There's always room to improve. So if you're using a single drive <clears throat> and your images are only on that one drive, that's really risky because you have a single point of failure. So if your entire photography collection is just stored on one hard drive, I'd like you to make some immediate changes after tonight. Now, maybe you've got a copy to another drive, and that's good. Now you've got double the chances. And if something goes wrong, as long as you make a copy of the other one, well, then you've got two copies. But sometimes people get busy or they forget to have a drive on hand. I just reach down over my shoulder here. I've got a hard drive in the bin ready to go. So I've got extra hard drives that I can grab if needed. And I've got a six terabyte and a 16 terabyte I can grab if I needed to clone my library if something went badly. Now, a lot of you might be using the cloud for things and cloud backup is a great option, but it can get a bit expensive, okay? So that 11 terabyte photo library, well, I don't want to pay for that to go to the cloud in certain cases because most cloud services would be charging me $10 per terabyte per month. So I don't really feel like spending $1,500 a year, but I'll share with you some cloud solutions that don't have those types of costs as we get going. RAIDs are good. I'm using one myself. And ideally, you can have multiple off-site backups or even a managed backup service. So this is kind of a spectrum from total chaos to complete safety. And where you fall on it is up to you. 
I end up having multiple offsite backups, but I don't use a paid service to manage my backups. Rather, I just back them up to two different cloud services, one that just purely mirrors the data and one that provides version control if I need it. Now, I also suggest automated backups. And this is something that you can run automatically. So for example, you've got a tool like Carbon Copy Cloner on a Mac, SyncBack Pro on Windows. These are great for keeping things in sync. You can also look at services like Backblaze, which makes it easy to go both to the cloud and to another hard drive that works on Mac and Windows or Crash Plan to go to the cloud. The key here is you want this to be totally automated. So I'm gonna show you this really quick so you can kind of appreciate what this looks like because it's not really backup if you have to invoke it manually. And that's what's important to note. You don't want this to be a manual process. So you'll notice here that I've got some mirroring and some backups going on. So I'm gonna actually disable this task right now because I don't need this one and I'll disable this one. There we go. But you're gonna see that I've got things set to clone. So for example, every day, Drobo 5D A goes to 5D B. And that's really simple. My photo library is on here and it gets cloned to this one. And Drobo 5D A also contains my time-lapse library. And that goes to 5D. And these are set to run every day automatically. Now, you don't need to use Drobos. I just happen to have a lot of these from past workflow, but you can set up one drive to go to another drive. And what this does is it creates a clone every night. And this is really safe because it means that things are backed up. But you'll notice here that I've also got an option called safety net, and that's on. So let me show you what that looks like here. So the safety net feature is great because it provides some additional protection. Let me share my screen. Here we go. And so here's that main photo library, right? 5D A1. I'll open that up. And here's its destination, 5D B1. Well, with that safety net feature, it detects if something changed. So for example, on this one drive, it detected a moderate tiny change, just actually an invisible file, but that's okay, I could review it. But if I were to delete something over here on my A drive, my B drive is gonna go, wait, I used to have that. Are you sure you wanted to delete it? And that's the benefit of the safety net feature. It's a second chance trash can. And it says, hey, you used to have these files backed up. Are you sure you want to get rid of them? And it's great because sometimes I find myself accidentally deleting things. So it's one more chance to review. And as you can see, it does a great timestamped folder to keep that organized. Now, throughout today's event, please use the Q&A pod. Put in any questions you want there, plus everyone else has the ability to upvote questions. So if there's anything I'm sharing with you that you'd like to know about or want to know more detail, just ask. And Carbon Copy Cloner is a Mac-only tool but SyncBack Pro is a Windows tool that's very similar and provides the same sort of features. So there are other tools out there and I'll put the list back up, but those work great. And as you can see here, I've got a nice clone going. So my photo library gets cloned each night and my time-lapse library gets cloned each night. And the video library, not my full video library, but my smaller DSLR video library at about seven terabytes, also gets cloned each evening. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, that sounds pretty good, but wait a minute, how's he getting all that data on one drive? Well, Drobos are a type of RAID, and they let you put several disks together in a case, and it stitches together into one drive. So I actually have about, gosh, if I were to add this all up, in the neighborhood of 10 terabytes in each of these, which is fine but there are actually drives that are that similar in size that you can get. So you can get big hard drives these days. For example, my Milio Home Vault, which we'll talk more about later, is a 16 terabyte drive from Seagate. 
and it's called a backup drive. It's not very fast, but it's very big, and it's only about $300 these days for 16 terabytes of backup data. So it's a great drive to attach, not to work off of to edit your photos because it's not as fast, meaning like you'll see lag as you try to do a lot of editing, but as just a big place to put your files, it's fantastic as another level of backup. So you really have no excuse to not set up something like this that keeps things backed up and secure. Okay, is the concept of cloning one drive to another making sense to everyone? Does anybody have any questions on that? Or just let me know in the chat pod if that makes sense. Give me a thumbs up or a quick, you know, go forward sort of thing so I know where you guys are at. Okay, awesome. Now, the question says, Drobo has not been available for some time. Are there other drives like Drobo out there? So Drobo has had a bit of a backlog during the, uh, the shipping here. So you are absolutely correct. Um, there are lots of solutions with multiple hard drives rated together. I also have a RAID from Otherworld Computing that I really much like. And you can look at things like Synology or QNAP, and those are some other good competitors that are similar to Drobo that provide similar type functionality. I'm just using a lot of Drobos because I've owned them for several years. And if a drive goes bad in my Drobo, it's got five drives in each, They've been set up so one hard drive can fail inside of each one with no data loss. In fact, I've set them up so two hard drives can fail before I lose data. So if I'm going to lose my photo library, it means that three drives would have to fail in this case out of five, and three drives would have to fail here in this case out of five. That's kind of paranoid, isn't it? <laughs> but this is 25 years of my photography. I really don't want to lose it. Plus, it's actually backed up two more times on-site, one more time off-site, and two in the cloud. So that was that whole paranoid thing. But none of you have an excuse to not have your main working drive cloning to a second destination, and that should clone every single night. I also clone using a, a fast SSD, a little tiny one from Crucial, and I clone my main computer each night so that if anything were to go wrong, I'd have that backup. So that's a utility like Carbon Copy Cloner that you see here. It allows you to say things like, hey, go ahead each night and clone. So I unplugged my backup clone drive just to take it with me when I went on the road last week. But before I go to bed tonight, I'm gonna plug it back in. And every single night at 2 a.m., which is kind of my threshold for, I should really be in bed by now, my computer will start cloning. I suggest setting it up to clone when you're not actively working because it does take a few system resources, not a lot, but it's a good idea to clone when you're not actively working on the computer. But this utility is great because on my laptop, same thing here. So my laptop is set up and I just take one of these SSDs with me. Uh, this is the X8 from Crucial, nice and fast and affordable. And every time I plug it into my laptop, the laptop goes, oh, that's your clone drive. And it just clones the data. It does a quick comparison between what you had before and then clones it to the drive, making an exact copy. So if something were to happen to my laptop, like say on the airplane, somebody passing a cup of diet soda to the person next to me drops it or knocks it over and spills onto the laptop, that has happened. It's gonna provide some protection. Now you're saying, oh really that's happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is why, uh, for those of you who are travelers, uh, I do one more thing. I get one of these nice little rubber keyboard mats here that provides an extra layer of protection from liquid spills that I could rip off or quickly mop off. So think of it as a raincoat for your computer. It also cuts down on grease and wear and tear on the keys, but there's lots of things like that you can do if you're a frequent traveler. I know, I'm paranoid but I've never lost data. So that's why you're here is to learn some of those strategies. Okay, so hopefully a tool like Carbon Copy Coner or Syncback Pro makes a lot of sense to you. You're able to set up rules and then when it detects it, it just runs automatically, which is pretty cool. You definitely wanna look at that as a tool for keeping things safe. Okay, so that's that list of cloning utilities here. Carbon Copy Cloner, Syncback Pro are the two that I use most often. But Backblaze, which is great for cloud backup, also lets you clone to another disk if you need to. So it's a great way to set up backup nice and easy. And that's actually a free utility. 
Now, how you get organized is another thing to think about. You can rely on AI search, where you're just using artificial intelligence to recognize the contents of your image. That's great. Tools like Lightroom provide this. You can use a tool like Xire to tag your images and it'll use scene detection and object recognition and try to guess. Now, it's not gonna recognize that that is a, you know, brown spotted, brown, brown spotted barn owl, but it might get owl, it'll certainly get bird. And so it makes it easy to find things when you're lazy, <laughs> you don't get around to tagging and keywording everything. Detailed folders are also great. I use these, keeping things for a particular client in a folder with nested folders for jobs or particular vacations or by year. These are all sorts of different strategies. Why don't you put in the chat some of your strategies on how you use folders just to share with other people here. I'm always surprised at the good ideas people have when it comes to folder organization. Some folks will use client numbers, job numbers. These are great ways to keep things organized if you're working professionally. Tags and keywords are good. And realistically, you should be using a series of both. I'm a big fan of organized folders because it means that I can move between applications. So I can keep an organized folder and use a tool like Bridge or Mylio that browses the folders. I can open those images into tools that I use to edit. So for example, Aurora HDR, Luminar, Photoshop, all tools I use to edit, perfectly clear. This way I could bounce between the right app for the job and all the results end back up in the folder for the job. So it's good to have a good organized approach with folders, it'll never hurt you. I see a couple of you have shared some of your ideas in the chat, so that's awesome. Detailed folders, absolutely works, that's great. And uh, <laughs> I'm glad that my paranoia, Makisha, is making you feel better because there's nothing wrong with that. So <laughs> these are your images. They're almost as important as your children or your fur babies if you have pets. So uh, I put them right up there. I would save my kids before my photo library, but my photo library would be a close second. And that's why I use one of those backup drives because grabbing the eight bay RAID system is not as easy as grabbing that cheap 16 terabyte hard drive that has a clone on it. So I use the higher end RAIDs for performance and redundancy, but cheap backup disks like the one I mentioned from Seagate, super easy to put into your workflow. All right. So a couple of things that you need to know, and we're gonna to get to some software tools, but these are some concepts that are really helpful. The first one is called 321 Backup. And I'm actually giving a dedicated webinar about this a little later this week on Tuesday. We're coming into this week, March 31st is World Backup Day. So I'll be giving a webinar on Tuesday and it will be replayed on Thursday, which is World Backup Day, all about the concept of 321 Backup. So we're not gonna to go too deep into it today, but it is a great concept to wrap your head around. And it says three copies of the media, one that you're working on, two backups, on two different types of media, ideally. You don't want them all stored in one place. Now, some people will use the same type of media and put them in different places. Me, I'm a bigger fan of using different type of storage. So while I might have something on a RAID, I'll also put it on a high capacity backup disk, or I might use an SSD for speed and portability. And ideally, one of those is stored off-site. So I actually use two tools to do backups off-site. I use Mylio to do a back site, backup off-site. And I also use uh, the Backblaze tool that I mentioned earlier. Crash Plan's another one. Makes it really easy to set up an off-site backup. In fact, I also have cloud backup going to Amazon Photos. And a lot of folks don't realize that if you have an Amazon Prime membership, Amazon Photos is free for JPEG, RAW, and TIFF in most countries. Not all countries, but most countries. It's one of those hidden benefits that you would never know unless you went digging around. Mylio connects to it, so it's automatic for me. But you can download the Amazon Photos uploader and put it on your phone and computer. And if you are an Amazon Prime member, you get unlimited RAW, TIFF, and JPEG backup. And all I pay for is one terabyte of extra storage at $100 a year. And that gives me the ability to back up some video files and my catalogs and databases. So it's like about $200 a year. And part of that cost is the free Amazon shipping that my wife and I use all the time to get stuff delivered. Uh, another thing you wanna do is clearly distinguish between your primary copy and the backup copy. 
So I'm actually working off of my Thunder Bay drive, which is a high performance RAID. And then Drobo A and Drobo B are actually both backups. So I have three copies of the data connected to this computer. Now, from a pure backup point of view, that's not great, but I have them all here in case something goes wrong. But I also have them in the cloud twice and backed up to a hard drive that's connected to a different computer. This way, if something were to go wrong with this computer or it were to become infected with the virus, those other locations are likely going to be separated a bit. And make sure you have your system backing up. Definitely back up your computer system. Cloning it is a really good idea. So you could be like this person on the left, calm and tranquil, or the person on the right screaming at your devices and mad at them for your bad behavior. So please consider remembering that the smart one in this relationship is you. Your technology is not going to do this for you. You are the one with the brain in the hands. You have to set it up, okay? All right. <clears throat> I'm glad to hear that, uh, that you're using detailed folders and backblaze, Fran. Definitely, that can help. Good sync is another good pro, uh, tool, absolutely. Uh, sorry that Amazon Prime does not offer that service in Australia. Uh, they hopefully will keep expanding that great offer. All right, so here's a snapshot of my computer, how I normally have it set up. And uh, this perfectly organized desktop is not perfectly organized sometimes. That's why I have these folders here. Uh, I actually use a utility called Declutter that will automatically toss pictures and documents and music and video into one of these auto collated, uh, auto cleaned up folders so that I can clean them up later. It keeps my desktop debugged. Um, but here's what we do. So I have my main computer and then I have a time machine drive booked up. And that's a good idea so that you can restore your computer if you're on a Mac. Now, Windows also offers a backup utility and it provides some snapshots of your operating system. I then have some different drives hooked up and you can use these in different workflows or ways, um, but I've got my main performance drive here. This is a Thunderbolt disk grade that I can edit video off of and has all my photos. It's very fast, it's connected with Thunderbolt. It's eight drives striped together for performance and it gives excellent workflow, but it's not at all designed for redundancy or safety. That's what my Drobos are for, slower, but redundant. I use some other drives here. I actually swapped this one out for a new drive that had some NVMe memory in it. So I've actually updated that and it's got a flash memory in it. And folks like Crucial, Micron, others make awesome flash memory that you can work off of very quickly. That's what this is, the STX. And so by putting in an NVMe stick, this is a type of SSD, it's excellent if you're gonna be working on a big photo. So when I have to edit a photo and I'm doing a lot of layers in Photoshop work, I put the source file there. That way my computer goes at maximum speed and it's really, really quick for editing. I've got a clone hooked up. I've actually got two. Again, we've established I'm paranoid. And every single night, my desktop computer makes an exact copy of itself. In fact, it makes two. So when I go on the road, I can grab one and take it with me. So if you ever forgot a file at home, oh, hey, I got my entire desktop with me. And I don't have to deal with the internet or the cloud trying to access those files. And if something were to go wrong or my computer was to get stolen or there was to be something damaging, a house fire, flood, I've had my basement flood, that's where my home office is. Well, this way the data is safe because I took a copy with me when I went on the road for work. So you kind of get an idea on how all these pieces work together. And that's that idea of three, two, one backup. So you really want to put this into place. Again, three copies of primary and two backup, two different media types, such as hard drive and optical or hard drive and SSD. And one copy should be off site. So when you've done this right, it works out really well. Three copies, one primary, two backups. Don't mix them up. Always work off of your primary so the backups stay in sync. Two types, put it on two different types of storage media. Don't put it on two drives by the same manufacturer because if something were to go wrong, 
it might go wrong on both drives. Manufacturing defects often carry across multiple drives. And one offsite, cloud works well here, but if you don't want to use the cloud, Mylio provides the ability to set up a hard drive in a different location like your office or at a colleague's house. All right, I put everything on the drive. Ideally, it's redundant. Make sure you copy it before you erase your memory cards and the act of copying will actually back things up. If you wanna learn more about 321 Backup, make sure you just head on over to photofocus.com and you can search for that phrase. You'll find a ton of articles. You can also check out dpbestflow.org. This was put together by Peter Krogh. Uh, he's the author of The Dam Book, the digital asset management book. And I was also a contributing author here. You'll find all sorts of information about backup. And this is really great if you wanna get super nerdy about keeping your files safe and organized. And as I mentioned, on Tuesday, we'll be offering this webinar twice, just a dedicated deep dive on 321 Backup. We'll also be recording it and releasing it on World Backup Day. World Backup Day is March 31st, and they ask you, what would you do if you lost everything? So be sure to think about World Backup Day this week. And if you're not backing up, add it as part of your workflow and take advantage of that World Backup Day on March 31st. Okay, let's go forward. Uh, there's a contest, by the way, on March 31st. You can find out more about it. We'll have it on photofocus.com. All right, let's put the slides aside for now and start to show you some specific workflows. So we're going to kick things off. And I already talked about keeping drives in sync. I want to talk briefly about Backblaze. And a good alternative to Backblaze is going to be a tool uh, called Crash Plan. Both work well. And what they do is you install them on your computer and they run constantly. Now, they are slow, but you get what you pay for. So in other words, these services are about $7 to $10 a month with unlimited cloud backup. So look at this number here. This number is actually accurate, folks, okay? I am putting 70 two terabytes into the cloud at $10 a month. Now, if I want to do a restore, if I lost data, they'll send you a hard drive for $180. And then you could send it back and they actually refund you the money. You just pay for the postage. Or you could do a restore over the internet. Now, it's still going. I've got seven, 730,000 files or about two terabytes of data left to go up to the cloud still, but that's okay. 72 terabytes in the cloud. It's amazing. And so you see that this computer is backed up. What this is telling me is I've got some files on my laptop, which is currently closed, that does still need to back up. So they do charge you per machine. So I keep my primary computer and my laptop going to the cloud. And at 20 bucks a month, I just call that an insurance policy. This is Backblaze. There is Crash Plan is its main competitor. There are others out there. And if anyone has anything that they'd like to say about these tools, I see a couple of you are using Backblaze. You mentioned it in the chat. But if others have other tools besides Backblaze and Crash Plan or anything they'd like to share, definitely share it. And this is kind of like that really cheap and affordable life insurance policy. It's slow, it's not great, but it's gonna give you key catastrophic recovery type things. So it's a good option to have. And I suggest taking a look at one of things like this because it's really gonna help keep things safe. All right, well, let's keep going forward here. We talked a little bit about that. You can see my different drives here. I got a few turned off and things we're gonna cover, but there's my clone of my laptop. Actually, of my desktop computer here. Every night, it makes a clone, which is a great safe place to be. All right, let's go on to Aftershoot now. So Aftershoot's a really cool tool. Aftershoot is an AI culling tool. And I'm going to show you how we set it up. So it runs and lets you process the images and automatically sorts out the best pictures. So let me make a new album here. And I'm going to add a folder. And I'm going to take this one here. This was my daughter's Eagle Scout ceremony. And you go in and you set up some rules of how you want it to process. So you just click start culling and you decide, hey, 
What about blurred photos? No shallow depth of field or a little bit's okay. Grouping of duplicates. How strict is it going to be? So it will find these here. And it basically looks within 30 seconds. If you use the extreme option, this is good for things like nature photography, where you're shooting over an extended period of time. Duplicates and set. How tolerant is it going to be? The top 10% or the top 20%? And sneak previews, which are specifically going to pull out the best images for social media. Now, there is a free version of Aftershoot. I invite you to check it out. It does most of the things that the pro version does. It just doesn't have all of the AI tools in it. Under advanced here, though, you see that it can detect closed eyes, blur detection, and duplicates, okay? Now, I'm gonna tell it to overwrite existing colors and stars, but if you had not, if you'd already put these images in your Lightroom catalog, for example, you could tell it to leave the current stars or labels alone. You also can decide what happens. Is it gonna add these as a keyword? Is it gonna change the color label or star rating? So you can decide if it uses colors or stars or anything else. So you can go through and easily apply this. Now I tell sneak peeks and select it to both be five stars, but I'll use the keyword sneak peeks to isolate it. I'll choose next, look it over, and start culling. Now it's gonna process those. Let me go back and queue up another job here while that's running. New album, add a folder. And uh, this time we'll take a vacation, import it, let it analyze. You see how quick it loads. By the way, if you use a tool like Photo Mechanic, you can absolutely use rating tools here and just cull through the photos manually, seeing them, marking your best pictures, et cetera. So you can rate and tag in here very easily. I'm gonna go ahead and say, start culling here. This time I'm gonna be a little bit stricter and a little bit more broad there. That looks good, good. And let's start culling. So that's gonna run when the other job is done. So you can actually load up multiple jobs and they'll start to run in the background. Now let's look at a job that I've already been doing. You'll also note here that it keeps track. So as you're working, Aftershoot starts to learn your style. So as you cull through more and more pictures, it will actually learn what you prefer. Here we go. So you can see how it took this photo shoot and sorted it down. So in this case, as I go through, it's sorting out the different pictures, identifying the best within each group. And I see that there's some duplicates. So here we go. I'm gonna tell this what to show me. So you see that we've got the ability here to filter and I could say, show me only the ones without duplicates. Well, now it narrowed that down to 33 images, which is pretty cool. And I can even say sort out by camera or file types. You can take a look and see only the portrait orientation images, for example. And so you can quickly sort through by criteria and narrow it down, which is really cool. You could say how you wanna sort here. So for example, only show me the ones that you think will do best on social media. And it's gonna cull those down and find the best pictures or the ones that are the highest quality images. Now, it's not gonna find every image perfectly, but what it does is it finds the best of each. So if we say to here, show all the pictures, you're gonna see what it did. And so in this case, when it says plus one, that's identifying that there was more in the set. But looking at this, I actually wanna group these a little bit more. So I'm gonna restart the culling and I'm gonna tell it to be a little bit more grouping. So go ahead and start to put those together here and group them a little bit more. So it's gonna look for similar images and group them. And go ahead and select less images per set. Good, I'll start culling. So now it's gonna redo that process there and recolumn. 
So notice how easy that is. Like if you don't get the culling results you want, you can recull the group very quickly and apply new criteria to sort. So that's what's awesome there about that culling is once it's done the first time, it only takes a few seconds to do it again. Now, what I do see here is it did a good job of automatically finding the closed eyed and the blurred photos. So there we go. Boom. I love their sense of humor too. They've got magical unicorns working in the background. <laughs> but here, let's take a look. These nine definitely have closed eyes. So if I don't want those because open eyes is important to me, look at this. It even recognized closed eyes with makeup and blurred. These images are out of focus. Well, I can take those right off the table. So this allows you to start to cull or remove some of the images. And as you look at those filters there, you can see how it's flagging them, right? Nice and simple. There we go. So this lets you narrow it down. So there, by culling more strictly, I got it down. Now, when you see the plus one or the plus two, that means that it found other similar images. So if we look at that there, you can see what it did is it picked this one as the best. But you can step through, and yeah, that one's soft. And so as we're in there, what I can do is use the up and down arrow to evaluate the different images within a set. And if I decide that I like one better, I just press the S key and it swaps it. Right arrow, I go to the next one. If I see one I don't want, no problem. I can just mark that as a zero star image and reject it. And so you could instantly go through and start to clean things up. So you just step on through your images and you can find the best ones very quickly as you're reviewing. I like that one, that's a five star. This one I'm not crazy about, but it speeds up your culling process so you don't have to review as many, which is pretty cool. Now, let me go into another album here. And uh, I see here that it processed that event. So this was my daughter's Eagle Scout ceremony and it quickly selected 48 pictures out of the group. So as I look at each of these collections here, let's take a look at this one. I can see what it did within that group and it felt that this was the best. And I can even go right into each face. So if you click, it lets you spot check the faces. See? And so you can step through while staying on one person. So if there's a person that's primary, you can make sure. It's really cool like that. So you can go in and out very quickly on the faces and check each face. Let's go here to another group. I'll go back a level here. And you can see again with the plus symbol, it's identifying within each group what it feels is the best image. So I'm gonna say I wanna see the selected images and that narrows it down. So what it was able to do was identify the best set of images from that event. And where it does is it picks the best image of any similar groups. So when you see multiple here, that's indicating multiple. Now, if you wanted to be more aggressive in putting those together, you could just restart the culling, see? And again, this time I'm gonna say, you know what? Group more duplicates together and get rid of more of the blurry photos and peek a little bit less of the sneak peeks. Go. So you can evaluate those criteria and just run them through and it will reprocess. Now I see a question, so let me tackle that. Does Aftershoot handle focus stacks? So right now, Fran, it's designed to look at single images. It won't get confused by them, but it will pick one of the stack. But they are expanding for focus stacking and exposure stacking. They're looking at some of those tools for product photography and landscape photography. It started as a tool for portrait and event photographers, but they have like 13 different tools that are checking for exposure, focus, eyes closed, blurry, um, proper exposure, et cetera. So they are expanding the tool set of how it picks. And I expect a little bit later this year, you'll see some updates to make it even better for those types of workflows. So I know the team is hard at work at expanding the number of types of photographers that can use it. 
I do use it though on nature photos and it absolutely does a great job of identifying the sharpest photos for me, which I really like because sometimes when I'm shooting nature, it's hard to just go through and find the sharpest photos. So there, it narrowed it down. These are the ones that things would do best on social media. We've got some hugs in there. We've got some great facial features, a great group shot. That's cool. There's the ones that are selected, which include the sneak peeks. And you can see there that I was able to cut that down from 150 to 40. And so you could step through and of course, reject a few more or keep a few more, but it's really that simple. It finds the best of each photo type that you shot. And if you're shooting burst, it's really useful. And if you decide there's one you don't want, you can get rid of it. But look, here's my daughter, I'm very proud of her. And as I look at that there, I can quickly see what's going on. So as I step through and look, she's looking away. She's a little bit forced. The hand position's not great. That's a lot better, better. That is the best one. So look, it actually looked at hand pose and facial pose and smile and found the sharpest photo. So it's really kind of cool. And if you find one you like, you can also just press the A key and it gets added to the selection. So you don't have to just pick the best one. If you see some that you go, you know, I really like this one too, that's a great smile. A for add, and it gets added to the selection. Right arrow, go to the next group. Up and down arrow. I like that smile, add. Right arrow key. And you can just quickly step through and find all the best pictures within the group. And it really nailed it. Look at that, all the great facial features. Each time I'm going, yeah, those are solid. There, there, he's looking away. So it's evaluating that and finding the best one. Now, when you're all done and you're ready, here's what it does. You just click a button and you can save the changes. This captures the changes into the project file. Then you've got two choices. If these images are stored in your Lightroom catalog or already stored in a catalog tool, you'll choose File, Rewrite XMPs. And this will update the XMP metadata files that are in use by other applications. So that works really well. And your other tools can scan those and it will now see the stars, the labels, the tags and keywords you added, okay? If you haven't gone someplace else, then you can click Export. And there's a one-click handoff to each of these tools. So I can go right to Lightroom, for example, or Capture One. Or you can go to a folder and it will move them. When you click that, what it's gonna do is launch that tool. So Lightroom just launched, there it is, great. I'll go back to Aftershoot here. There's the handoff. And you see it queued up an import. And so it selected all of those for import that I had marked as five and four stars, and they're there. And when I'm ready, I'll just click add photos. Some of these I had previously added before, so that's why they're grayed out. So that's why it's telling me. So if you use this to call a job, even an existing job, you can go back and find other gems that maybe you didn't add in your catalog. And now they're handed off and stored. So you've got that one click handoff to Lightroom, Lightroom Classic or Capture One, or you can move them into new folders. And Aftershoot also gives you the ability when you say export to folder, to choose a location, choose which ones are going to be exported. It'll actually make subfolders for you. And whether it moves them or copies them, and even if it does a batch rename. So it's a really cool organizational tool. I hope you see some benefit with that. All right, let's tackle a couple of those questions. And then we're gonna get another tool open. Uh, I see Fran says, does the updating of XMP files mean that Lightroom will see that? Yes, Lightroom can absolutely see it, Fran. You just may have to tell Lightroom to scan or reread the XMP metadata files. So in Lightroom, there is a, a command called um, load photo data, I believe, or reread metadata from file. That's what it is, reread metadata from file. And that will load it in and update the metadata. If you're using Capture One, it will just see it and it should update as well. So you could force it to update the metadata very seamlessly and you can use that for existing images you already have. Now, if you want to use Light uh, Aftershoot without changing stars and colors, absolutely. So all you would do there, Fran, is this. So when you would choose the 
culling preferences there uh, and you were getting ready to export, what you can do there uh, when you first set up the cull is you had a choice. So let me add one here, one second. I'll add a new album and start it, add a folder. Let's bring in these eagles here. And in this case, I'll go to the culling settings. I'm gonna use extreme. So it groups more of them together by similarity because there's not as much time sensitivity. Tell it to pick fewer, but more sneak peeks for social. And then down here, overwrite existing colors and stars. So if you've already got colors and stars, turn that off, but go here. And what you can do is just tell it to write keywords instead. So now the keywords are added. And when you cull, it will store that data just as keywords. And you'll be able to find keywords like blurred, closed eyes, duplicate, et cetera, inside of the library. So you can use keywords instead of stars or labels. So Fran, I hope that that answers your question, okay? Cool. So that'll give you that flexibility to use the system just fine. All right, I'm gonna quit Lightroom here, free up some memory. But as you saw, super simple handoff there. Let me go ahead and put this aside. I'm using a early test build of Mylio to show you some cool stuff. But uh, let's open this up. Thank you, Fran. I'm glad that solved your problem. So Mylio, is a organizational tool. Now, I'm gonna stop sharing my computer for a moment and I'm gonna share my tablet, just so you can see this. This is my Mylio library. This is 11 terabytes of photos shrunk down to my iPad, taking up about 500 gigabytes of space on this iPad Pro. Now, on my iPhone, it's shrunk down to about 20 gigabytes because on my phone, all I have are thumbnails. So the thumbnails let me see my entire photo library. So on my smartphone, I can browse all 25 years of photos. Boom, 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 boom. And with the tap of a button, if I see a picture I want, I can open it, it opens. And I could just say, oh, go ahead and download the original. And it actually talks to my computer here over the internet and pulls it down to my phone on demand. I've also put the smart previews onto the Amazon Cloud I mentioned to you. And I've put the raw files on Amazon Cloud. So Mylio makes smart previews. That's what you're seeing right here on the tablet. These are smart previews. So Mylio imports my Aperture library. It imports my Apple Photos library. It imports images from uh, Flickr and Facebook. So I can go in, for example, and just connect right to Facebook and pull down all my pictures I've ever posted to Facebook. And this works even with the free version of Mylio. And so every time I post a new picture to Facebook, I can just reach out to Facebook and grab those. And look, it's pulling them down, right? So it's gonna actually grab that. Let me go to my timeline photos, for example, and I'll just sort this here by name. There we go. Look, all the albums are intact. Here's that family trip to Hawaii. And I forgot about some of those pictures because I posted them right from my phone. Here is my timeline photos. There we go. Here's some pictures I posted just recently. My daughter and I working out, all right? I can grab all those right there and everything's available. But let's go to the ones that really matter, not just the social media ones. I can see all these photos that I'm still trying to organize. So here's my photos to migrate folder. These are some recent photo shoots that I haven't gotten around to organizing. I can see the data. I can go in and these are all smart raw files. So if I wanna see if a photo is gonna be usable or not, watch what I can do. So these are basically raw files. So I can go into the edit module and lift up things like the shadows or highlights. See, play with the exposure, recover detail. 
All of that is available inside the image, see? And so look at what I was able to do. And with the tap of a button, when I'm ready, I can share that image. So now, boom, I've got my entire share system. I can go to any other app on my iPad that supports it or the same thing on my phone. I can post it to Dropbox, add it to an email, a Notion document, send it to Lightroom, post it to Instagram, any other service that my device recognizes for photos. So I have all 25 years of my pictures here on my tablet in an editable format. By the way, you could be in offline mode. You don't need the cloud. None of this is using the cloud. It's working with a small raw file that's stored locally. So when I go to all photo view and I wanna see really all of my photos, this is 25 years of photography, folks. There's my wedding. There's a time-lapse sequence. There's some more time-lapses. There's some panoramics from a trip. You can tell I like to shoot time-lapse. <laughs> There's some more, see? I can see all of this, boom. See all those pictures from that trip. And if I see something that I want to bring out or edit, I can. Tap, there it is. I can sort through. I like this one. Let me go ahead and edit that just really quick. Auto enhance, ready to go. I can crop, I can adjust, everything. It's all non-destructive. And with the tap of the button, it shares. But here's what's really cool. Mylio is also on my laptop. So I have that same catalog. And there's a feature called tap to sync. So if I'm on my laptop or my tablet and I realize that there's a photo that I need or an entire folder for a job that I forgot, I could just tap and bring it down. So with one tap, I could say, download the originals. And what it does is it reaches out to my computer, or if you put them in the cloud, and it pulls it down to the local device temporarily. So it creates a peer-to-peer -peer network between all of your devices, your phone, your tablet, all your laptops, your desktop computer, can all see each other over the internet. No cloud required. And when you need to, you can pull things down on demand, which is really cool. Plus, if you're organizing, any metadata you add is added. So you can add keywords, tags, ratings, GPS data, right? So I know, for example, with these sunflower photos, I can locate and place those where those were. I could say, you know, all those pictures, I was in Lexington, Virginia. So let me just add that in. And Virginia. Boom, good. And I can just drop those onto there or add it. And so this gives you the ability to add tags, keywords, et cetera. You can see everything about it, right? Let's just go back. Notice how easy that is. You can move things around. So if I move them to a folder, they're actually moved on my hard drive back home. And here's what I love. When I look at calendar, I can see where was I. I can check my calendar and see where I plan to be that day. So here, I've got photos coming from multiple sources. I actually have my iPhone photos mixed in with my DSLR photos in the same place because the calendar just looks at the dates on my calendar and it doesn't matter what folder the images were stored in. So I can see my iPhone photos and my DSLR photos mixed together, even though they're stored on my iPhone and on my hard drive here, because it mixes them into one universal photo library. I can go to the map and I could see that trip we took to Italy. Tap to go in and there's all the pictures from that trip. Go back out to the map and I can search to find things. I can go visit my friends when I was last in the Ukraine and I can check on my friends. I can see my trip to any country. And if you had metadata from images, for example, that you shot on your smartphone, you could say, hey, that's cool. There's my friend Vanelli. 
And now what I can do is say, show this in the calendar. And there's all my pictures from London because it didn't matter that they weren't geotagged. I just found everything from that same date. And so the beauty here is that you can sync things and find them. So Mylio lets you search across GPS data, a calendar that actually connects to your Google calendar or your iCal and by people. So if you need to find people, watch this. I can go in and look for photos. And so if I wanna see every picture of my friend Vanelli, I could just go to his folder. There it is. And here's some of the pictures through the years. The ones with the checkbox are ones that my Milio thinks are Vanelli. So I can go to proposed and say, yeah, that's all Vanelli. Select all and go ahead and approve. Boom. Now those are confirmed. There they are. And so I could see different pictures through the years of us traveling together and some of the things we've been on. I can look at pictures of my kid or my mom. And using the search bar, you could even search for things like two people in the same photo. So if you wanna find pictures of yourself and your spouse or you and a friend. So you can actually use the search bar and search by all sorts of criteria, which is really cool. And as we mentioned here, you have total control. So let me stop sharing for a moment and I'll share my desktop instead. This gives you the ability to see all that content. So here's everything on my desktop computer, right? And you can see on the right here, everything in sync. So you can add multiple devices and control exactly what happens. So my iPad was set up so that it automatically got previews for all images. Those are those smart raw files, smart previews. But you can go in and be super specific. If you say, you know what? I also wanted to get some originals. Go ahead and make sure that all my five-star photos with a blue tag are stored on my iPad. So you can go in and sync by keyword or tag or star label. And that will set up rules of what gets backed up where. So if you always want to have your five-star photos on your laptop, just add your laptop and then go in and set up the rules. And so you can see here that I can browse all of my devices. Like I see that my laptop needs 11 files that I added to my photo library that are on my photo library at home that aren't on my laptop. If I open up the laptop and launch Milio, it'll have those files. All it has to do is see each other over the internet and everything stays in sync. So you can work with current photos, old photos. You can add metadata. You can see embarrassing pictures of your host. <laughs> you can go in and organize those very seamlessly and keep everything in perfect sync across your devices. But what I really love is that ability to keep it on my tablet and smartphone because it means that I can sit on the couch and organize pictures. I can be on an airplane. And if a client calls or there's just something I want to share to social media, those smart previews, those raw files, those mini raw files, they're big enough to make a five by seven inch print. They're more than big enough for social media or any slideshow or presentation you have to give. So 23 years of photos, 500 gigs on my tablet, a catalog of everything, 20 gigabytes on my smartphone. Laptop, same thing. I don't have all 500 gigs stored there, but I just have certain folders and on demand, I can click a button and it will download. So I hope that this makes sense how you can keep all these things together and keep it organized, okay? Glad to see you guys are enjoying Aftershoot. That's awesome. Good to see some chat going on. Cool. Let's see here. Looks like you're getting some stuff from BSC. So yep, we'll make sure that that happens. Uh, so those should be coming out real soon to you. Also check your junk folder, make sure that you didn't miss them. And uh, I'm glad you see that you have problems with Zoom is late. Yeah, Zoom can be buggy. It definitely can. So uh, I hope that that works. All right, well, let me see if there's any other questions. Otherwise, we'll revisit anything else that you guys want to see. Let's go back to Aftershoot really quick and uh, take a look at how that cull was coming along. So I did do a cull on those eagles. So it was able to pull out 33 pictures from the 400. Now, before you go, ooh, that was by design, okay? I was shooting eagles. They move very, very quickly. 
So I had it pull out the best. And so it automatically pulled out the blurred photos. And as I look here, I see it did a pretty darn good job. Now I'll crop a little tighter on some of these, but it definitely found good photos. And I love that it got the strike there, right? But again, it organized them. So you can step right through and see which ones it organized. If you see one and you wanna see what else is in a group, all you have to do is double click to open up the group. But this definitely found some great images and was able to organize quickly. If I wanna review what else was in this group, I'll click here on five to see the similar images. And then I can use the up and down arrow. Yep, that one is a good solid pose. Go to the next one. And so it's super simple to review. I like that one, two birds in one, right? That's a great one. Love the tips of the feathers, okay? So this makes it easy to step through and see, and it did pick a better one. So they're starting to refine their algorithm here for non-portrait photographs. And it's looking for sharpness. It's looking for good color. And just that ability to organize and sometimes find the best one within a group is gonna speed things up. Now there's ones in here that it's not great, but again, it was the best of the group. But if I look at the sneak peeks here, definitely identified some solid photos for sharing. Really like that one. Really like the strike here. This would be a good crop here, lose the horizon line and see it going over the, over the water. So again, nice and simple. And more useful was the ability to just weed out all the ones that were blurry. But again, if you wanna be more tolerant of blur, you can always restart the culling. Just look at the criteria and I could say, you know what? Go ahead here and be less strict on the blurred photos. I was shooting action in birds. But that's good, and uh, be a little broader on the selections. Open that up a little more. Cool. Restart culling, and just takes a few seconds. It'll finish the job and get it organized. And there we go. So that allows you to plow through. While that's running in the background, remember, you can process additional jobs. You could see how it selects. Let's just take a look at this shoot. We hadn't seen this one yet. Go ahead and show me the best from that vacation. There's some good cute ones in there. That's adorable. <laughs> That's a good use of color. That's another adorable smile. It recognized a flag as in where were we? This one, not so much. AI can be tricked. I really like this one here. Great emotion with my wife and daughter. And again, the ability to filter out closed eyes blurry photos just lets you narrow it down more quickly and get rid of the ones that aren't the ones that are best and you can go through again and sort and sift but it is going to speed things up and make it easier to isolate the best pictures best facial features and narrow it down and it can really speed up that workflow because you'll find the sharpest photos and the best of each group and again with the restarting of the culling if you want to narrow it down just tell it to select less duplicates and tell it to be a little bit more strict on the culling of blurred photos. Just start the culling again and it will process the job. So this works great so that if you're not happy with the cull, you can run it again. Each time you do, you'll see the results and how you've narrowed it down. All right, cool. I'm gonna go ahead and quit that job here really quick. Let's exit. And uh, let's just take a look last at Milio. We talked about the ability there to sort. You can look by the map data. You can look by the calendar. You can see all your photo shoots over everywhere. And as you zoom in, get more and more detail. So let's go here down into Florida, for example. And so if I wanna see a place I visited multiple times, like say Disney World, I can see all my pictures. It doesn't matter that they were spread out over a bunch of years. There's everything from the most recent trip with the high school senior, all the way back to our first trip with our kids when they were toddlers. And it doesn't matter that they're stored in all these different folders on my computer. I could see them by GPS data and find them. 
And if I see ones where I don't have map data, maybe I wanna find ones from this date. Oh, there's my friend. Let me go ahead and say, just show me that on the calendar. And there's all the pictures that I took on that day organized. So this will give you the ability to organize by date and calendar. And you can make albums and folders and everything you do will sync back to your original drives. All right. Cool. Let me go ahead and bring up our presentation to wrap things up. And the question was, do you know if they have a, a date for iPad for Aftershoot? Uh, I don't know when they're going to have iPad for Aftershoot. I know they've been talking about different stuff, so uh, they might, but I don't think they've announced anything yet. So thanks for coming out. My name's Rich Harrington. Appreciate you joining us tonight. If you guys want to connect on LinkedIn, feel free to reach out. Not too hard to find. Uh, I did tell you that uh, we'll be having more webinars this week. So on Tuesday, I'll be doing two webinars, uh, about a 40-minute webinar on the 3 to one backup concept. You can find more information about that over at photofocus.com. So be feel free to check that out. And uh, if you want to look up our companies, you can do so. And uh, we're going to be releasing a new ebook this week called A Guide to Safer Backups for Photographers. So we'll have that up on Photo Focus this week in honor of World Backup Day. It's about a 50-page guide to help you understand some of these concepts of making safe backups. So you'll find that over at photofocus.com. And we'll release that this week because Thursday is World Backup Day. So definitely be sure to check that out. And uh, I hope that that helps you and gives you some more info. Again, photofocus.com, great resource to help you learn more about photography. We publish inspiration every day in education. We've been publishing now for 23 years, and uh, I think you'll enjoy that. So again, thank you guys for coming. And this is Drowning in Photos. I hope you got some strategies here on how to keep your photos organized and accessible. Again, the benefit of using a tool like Milio is that you can organize on your smartphone or tablet, even without the internet. And what's really cool with tools like Aftershoot is you can start to cull through your hard drives with the pictures and pull out the best, often spotting ones you might've missed or ones that you want to quickly identify for additional editing. So thank you guys for this. Be sure to check that out. And I appreciate you coming today.